Welcome everybody, delighted to be here. Um, a collaboration between NAA France and the NAA UK. It's the first one uh, that we've done. Uh, we run the Business Angels here in the UK. This is slightly different. This is the pitch lab that's been running in France for many years. So with that, I'll hand over to Sebastian, who's from the French NAA and started the whole thing. Thank you. Thank you, Charlotte. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you very everyone for being here. Um, yes, we're very happy to try this new format uh, co-organized with our friend from the UK. Um, as Charlotte was saying, this is the pitch lab. This is slightly different from the Business Angel Club. This club has been started 10 years ago by uh, Gilles Le Guenec. It's now its 57th edition. Um, the, the spirit of this event is to allow entrepreneurs a bit before the funding, uh, funding phase to try and, and practice their pitch in front of an inside audience. And God knows, maybe they'll get some funding as well. Thank you. We have someone with an open mic. Please, please mute yourself. Um, so this international edition, uh, international edition, yeah, we try to take advantage of the pandemic to internationalize our event uh, because you, the, the INSEAD crowd, is obviously international. And so we have started from France, from the UK, even from Germany, I think. So it's a very international event. Thank you all for being here. And we'll hope uh, it will answer your expectation. Um, so we have today five startups. Each startup will get 10 minutes, precisely 10 minutes, one, no, not one minute more. Um, we'll divide it between the five minutes, approximately presentation and the Q&A. So please ask your question through the chat. So please mute your mic, ask uh, the question through the chat. Um, this event is recorded for your information. Um, and so we have the five startup in this order. First, we have Click and Arinda who's here. Then we'll get the presentation of Uniloan, then Gilbert by Mathieu, then Altovita by Vivi and Jam Donut by James. So this is it for today. Um, one last message for the French, uh, the member of the French NAA. Uh, we're starting an operation of sponsorship. So if you have great friends who are not a member of the French Association and who would enjoy uh, uh, viewing this kind of event, for example, please, please, you can, you can um, sponsor some people by sending their name to membership at uh, INSEAD the Alumni France. Um, and they'll get a 20% discount and you'll get a gift as well for sponsoring them. So thank you very much. And we'll start right now with the first startup, which is Click. Thanks, Sebastian. Um, so to present Click before Arinda um, gets to the floor. Um, so some of you heard about or know about social shopping, which is a super hot trend in China is coming to Europe and uh, to the US. Uh, so for instance, this morning I read an article saying that um, more than 20% of the UK shoppers use social media uh, to discover their um, new products. And so it's a huge market. Um, Click is planning to uh, get part of it by creating this great experience that Harinda is gonna um, tell us about. So Harinda, the floor is yours. Am I okay to start? Hi, everyone. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Harinda. I'm a former Inseader Gamba 13, and I'm also a co-founder of ClickMe. Um, the vision of our platform was to be able to make everything on Netflix shoppable. And in order to do so, what we have to do is try to get rid of the traditional ads. Um, the um, basically, the, in, in advertising, they use a platform called uh, audience targeting, and this is where they vacuum all of our individual data in order to, to target you individually for uh, displaying personalized ads. However, uh, this is actually on its way out. Google, Apple, um, they are starting to stop using the, the third-party cookies and for individuals. And at the same time, the, there's also privacy laws along with um, the change of consumer behavior, which is probably the most important thing. And so what we're starting to do is actually something completely different called content targeting. And the way content targeting works is that each one of us use the internet to consume content. So this could be 
anything from influencer content, news, but even TV and movies. And so what, we, what we've noticed is that people actually want to be able to see the products that are in there and to be able to pull them out of the videos that they're watching or the photos that they're seeing. And so this is actually much more organic. Uh, users get to see an ad-free experience of the content they consume. Influencers are able to now start generating traffic and income um, while still being authentic. And I think coolest of all is for brands who are spending a lot of money to be able to get people onto their website. Now we're actually turning this around and what we're doing is we're taking their catalog, we're decentralizing it and taking the right products and placing them in front of the uh, people shopping for similar stuff. Um, the way our platform works is that you have uh, influencers, and we started off with influencers. They essentially auto-generate what we call a shoppable link, and they place this on their profiles on Instagram and on TikTok. This generates traffic onto our pages, what we call the shoppable pages. And at the, the anatomy of it is that we show um, the influencers post at the very top, along with um, you know, a catalog of similar and suggested shops for them. And of course, a percentage of that will actually end up flowing through to the e-commerces. And so from a business model perspective, the way it works is that influencers generate traffic for us, a percentage will go to the e-commerces, but the e-commerces are paying for this attention. So they pay us to be able to show product impressions. So what we do is we use AI to go through their entire catalog of products to show the most similar and suggested products. And then we aggregate the revenue and do a 50% revenue share with influencers that generate traffic for us. Um, so our progress to date is we've signed up over 1,800 influencers, generated over 150,000 people onto our pages. We've brought over 100, almost 100,000 people onto the e-commerce pages. And while we are uh, not revenueing yet, because, and I'll talk about the progress in a second, we have actually started simulating the market conditions for influencers and we've paid out $4,000 to them. Um, this is actually important to note that any, influence, any brand that is using influencer marketing would have spent 10 times this amount. Um, what we have done is we're now in negotiations with an Italian TV studio to use our technology to make TV shows and documentaries shoppable on Amazon Prime TV. We're also talking with Diesel um, because they want to run a, a large campaign with us and also with a casting agency to generate, to bring on board 25,000 actors, uh, models and influencers to generate traffic for us. Um, and how does it scale? I just wanted to make a quick note about the fact that um, one thing that we did was we ran one video on TikTok just as an experiment and it generated 45,000 views, 4,000 people visited the shoppable link and 553 people ended up going onto the e-commerces. And on top of that, 300 new influencers signed up doing all the process autonomously themselves, generating even more traffic. And all of this happened in 24 hours. And so if you apply this actually to the demographic that we're going after, yes, the social commerce industry is gigantic. Um, however, what we're really going after is the target that no one else is really focusing on, which is the people that are 50,000 followers and lower, and even down to the regular person with an average account. We are the ones that generate the most traffic on the internet, and we can monetize this, every single one of us. Um, we are doing a fundraise at the moment of 600,000 uh, pounds. I'm happy to speak with investors that would be interested in, in us. Um, but more importantly, I'll talk about what we uh, do have as an ask. Um, we have competitors. The largest ones are the big ad tech companies. And these are, of course, um, you know, what they do is they have linear ads. So one ad, one product. All of the other competition is focused on the sale of products. And what we do is we focus on the air traffic control. So that is actually where we have found the most capital and the most interest here. Our team is filled with people with, from Google, Apple, um, Jumia, and even Flipkart. And you also have an insider, insider there, uh, which is me, myself. And um, essentially, I'm really happy to connect with folks that are in the um, retail, the e-commerce space, uh, ideally within clothing, because we started within the clothing vertical. But we'd love to be able to connect with other people also in ad tech as well. I'm happy to take any questions, but thank you. Thank you, Harinda. Awesome. We have um, around four minutes for uh, questions. So I start with uh, Rebecca, who's asking, uh, how is it different um, from just an influencer tagging a product or, um, or brand in, in, its, in the posts they put on Instagram or TikTok or elsewhere? Absolutely. So the very first thing is that um, influencers that do this, they are only able to 
generate any sort of revenue if they are a selling product. So when you actually look at the chain that goes from social all the way to the sale of a product, the whole trajectory is quite long. Um, and what we do is we actually capture all of the traffic, place that traffic on a marketplace, and allow the influencers to generate revenues from the traffic they generate. This is the, this is the biggest difference between any other platform. Um, a lot of the other ones are a bit fragmented because they have to go and sign up for a number of different affiliate um, platforms, which is a bit of a tedious process. But I think the most interesting one is the, the importance for the followers who are able to shop similar and suggested products. So we've actually found that two to three times the amount of traffic is interested in shopping the similar and suggested rather than the exact matches that the influencers are wearing. Okay, cool. Um, perhaps the question around your go-to-market, because it, perhaps um, I didn't understand how you're going to either onboard all these influencers, because you have on the one side the brands that I understand it's a B2B, and the other side the influencers. Yeah, so uh, to onboard the influencers, actually, we started with uh, digital ads just to be able to see what our, our cost of acquisition was. Um, it turned out to be incredibly low at 30 cents per person. Um, this just brought us the initial traction, but then what we ended up doing is actually embedding ourselves into the communities. So there are influencer communities that we are now talking to. The second thing we do is we work with agencies as well. Our revenue model on the basis of actually hoping to work with Netflix in the future is that content creators have uh, different cost structures. And so we're able to do revenue shares with a number of different players. So we work with agencies as well. And then the final thing that actually we've tested but haven't rolled out yet because it, it works a little bit too well is the referral. So we actually work with influencers to say, bring on other influencers. And uh, that referral allows us not just to save uh, a lot of money, but it also saves us on onboarding costs as well. Perfect. Can you, because Benoit asked the question that is linked to this, perhaps um, say more about the economics of the venture, because we kind of understand now a little bit about the cost, but the economics in general. Absolutely. So the individual uh, follower that lands on a specific page will see on average about 10 uh, impressions of products. So they will see 10 products. Um, this is how much they scroll through the page on average. Um, what we do is we go to e-commerces and we go, we use AI to scan for their entire catalog and we, we pick out the top two products to display and we charge the brands uh, five cents for each impression. So it can be a maximum of two, so we don't burn through their budget. Um, and then what we do is of those 10, we display two of those products. If we have a second advertiser, we can do four products and so on and so forth. Um, and then what we do at the moment in the cost structure is we pay the influencer up to five cents. So that's only up to 10% of the entire revenue we generate. In the future, we plan to be able to do up to 50% of the revenue we generate on the page. Okay, cool. Uh, just to understand something um, in, in your technology, you said that you match um, through AI the um, based on the images that the influencer is put, putting on his whatever TikTok, Instagram. You match a product that is similar, but it's not the exact product, right? That's right. Uh, isn't there any problem of putting a product that at the end the influencer doesn't agree with and vice versa? Um, so far, we have not come into that issue because the influencers are able to authentically post and still generate revenues, so they haven't complained. We can imagine in the future that we would want to allow the influencers to both filter what we display below, um, but at the moment, it has not been an issue, and it is something we plan in our pipeline later on. Super. Thanks a lot, Arinda. We are perfectly at time. Okay. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, time to introduce uh, Unilone. So Ludovic, uh, please, uh, can you share your screen? And uh, Ludovic, uh, tell us about a very important topic is and uh, an innovative is uh, how to finance uh, studies. And uh, so please, uh, Ludovic, the floor is yours. Thank you, Yves. Um... So I'm very pleased to present to you uh, Unilon, whose mission is to remove financial bias to, to higher education. Um, so quickly on the team, um, myself, I'm founder and CEO, and we have also uh, Philippe and Estelle here today, who are both uh, insiders. And we have been joined later by Fabrice Couturier, who is a, a sole entrepreneur in the insurance tech sector. Um, 
so just to give you a little bit of, of the background, when I was doing my uh, my um, MBA at INSEAD, I realized that uh, most of my uh, classmates were struggling to finance uh, their, their study uh, with with local banks. And um, digging a little bit, what was the reason behind is that uh, actually the banks always require a guarantor uh, in order to to grant the loan. And um, looking further, this was not limited to international students, but to uh, any student who uh, uh, had, had no guarantors. So basically, the idea was to try to find an alternative to that. And um, <clears throat> so it's it's a quite massive issue because uh, every year it's like three hundred thousand students that are um, so barred from uh, from financing their, their study. Um, so mainly because they lack uh, guarantors and they have the sense to have the family behind them, and also the the application is quite uh, is quite cumbersome. Uh, a lot of documentation to produce, and uh, it's it's not digital at all because you have to sign it uh, manually. So solution we have developed is uh, an innovative qualification system based on the open money pot that we'll describe in, in a second. A digital platform uh, which allows students to uh, um, do the application online and a, a service of financial coaching because we have realized that uh, for a lot of students, it's the first time they take a loan. So they really need um, some people to, to help them through the process. So, <clears throat> This open money pot is really a, a unique approach to, to the borrower qualification. Uh, basically, how it works, we ask the student to gather a 5 to 10 percent of the loan amount it would like to, to get through uh, different um, parties. So uh, friends and family, the school, and uh, the company when, when, he's, when he's working. Okay? And uh, at the end of the day, this, this, this individual money pot is transferred into a mutual fund which will uh, guarantee the loan for the bank. Okay. So it's, it's really important because each of these parties will bring some value uh, in, in the qualification. The students uh, show commitment by putting some of his saving in, in, into the money pot. The friends and family bring some trust, uh, meaning that the person can be, can, be, uh, can be trusted. The schools help with fraud prevention and also attest the capacity to succeed of the student and uh, the company uh, also demonstrates that uh, the student has uh, a chance to be employed or after after his uh, after his graduation so really um, really a, a very a very strong qualification system thanks to this uh, uh, say, um, multiple elements that are, are combined into into the money pot and uh, obviously the idea is that at the end of the day the bank will uh, grant the loan and um, and help the student to, to achieve his, his, his career. Um, so in terms of customer value, I think it's for students quite uh, quite obvious. Get his loan without the need of, of a guarantor. Um, the financial coaching, which will help him to um, really um, uh, refine his needs and make sure he's only borrowing what he needs, and so uh, at the end of the day, save some costs and uh, a full online um, experience. For schools, uh, we know that uh, at the moment, financing is one of the key hurdles they, they are facing. Uh, tuition fees are always getting higher. And um, with our system, there is a great leverage because with only 5%, they can help the student to finance 100% of, of, of the tuition fees. Finally, the banks, um, access to a new market. So why a new market? Because as we've seen before, um, there is no solution for for students who don't have a guarantor at the moment. So it's it's really it's really a way to enter a, a, we say an untapped market. Uh, Pre-selection of the student through uh, the money pot that we have just described. Risk reduction via the mutual fund, and uh, at the end of the day, a lower customer acquisition cost. So how do we make money? Um, so we charge admin fees to the student. Um, Banks uh, pay us worker fees because we, we bring uh, we bring um, business. And uh, what we plan to do in the future is to also pro propose uh, insurance products on the platform, which will uh, add, add a new a new uh, uh, streams via insurance companies. Uh, Ludovic, uh, you still have four minutes, including the Q and A. 
Okay. Yeah. So very quickly, we did uh, we did the uh, MVP of BNP Paribas last um, last summer. Uh, very very good uh, um, event. Uh, seven hundred plus seven hundred application, first customer and our first partnership with Intel. Where we are at the moment, so we are finalizing the partnership with BNP Paribas. So we are out of the test process, working on the MVP with Credit Recall. And um, we have received an LOI from UM Normandy, which is a big uh, business school in France, to participate in the fund. Uh, financials, so very quickly, oh, we, we like to get 12% of the market share in, in five years, uh, which will generate 8 million in uh, revenue and uh, 6 million in EBITDA, which is, uh, I believe, a very good uh, margin. And uh, today we are trying to raise uh, 500k to, uh, to hire our first, uh, first uh, salaries. Uh, boost the platform development, marketing, and the development of the partnership. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ludovic. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, could you tell us a, a little bit more about the, the business model, uh, the way it works, how you, yeah, this particular slide, yeah, could you yeah. tell us uh, what about the fees on the student side, uh, the fees and uh, on, yeah. on, on the bank, and, and, yeah. uh, Next step for, for the insurance company. Absolutely. So um, admin fees at the moment we are at uh, two percent of the loan amount. Okay, so that's uh, that's a one one time cost for the student. Regarding the bank, so it's um, it's a, a paper transformation model. So basically, uh, when we we send leads to the banks, and then if the student opens a bank account, there is a remuneration attached to it. If the student open the bank account plus take a loan, the, the remuneration get, gets higher. That's basically how it works. So the more the, the student, I would say, buy product from the banks, the bigger the, the, the revenue is for us. Okay. And for, for, insu for insurance, it will be the same same model. So basically uh, pushing some, some, some leads to, to the insurance companies and uh, with, uh, with a percentage of the, of the premium. From the chat, there is a question about uh, you may want to look at uh, talking about the competitive environment to MOS, MOS. They are in the same space in the US. Have you heard of that company? Um, yes, we, we know that they are active in the company, but at the moment, um, in, not in Europe. Um, but yeah, we, we are looking at what they do. And can you duplicate? Uh, so I guess your first uh, your first uh, focus will be the, the French market or France. And mm -hmm. how easy can you duplicate this to other countries in Europe? So um, we, we we expect to 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 to, uh, to go to um, to European countries such as Spain and Italy, where the, the system is quite similar to, to France. Um, uh, because in the UK or the US at the moment, it's, it's a different approach. Um, the state is, is, is um, say, backing the loan. But um, yes, in, in countries like uh, Belgium, Spain, and Italy, it's more, very much like, like France. So we believe we can, we can easily uh, re replicate the same principle um, to, 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 to those countries. And um, I would say um, what we do is, is really a, a qualification. And um, this this can this can work with students because this is what we are focusing now. But it can work for other type of uh, potentially other type of, of people. Okay. Now the, the last question on the on the chat. Uh, uh, you seem like uh, mainly targeting the top tier business uh, school. Is that is that correct, or are you targeting? A, a, do you have a wider target? No, we, we, have, we have a wider target. Uh, what we've seen during the MVP we, uh, we did last, last, uh, last year with uh, BNP Paribas is that uh, our product is really attracting uh, very diverse uh, profiles. Uh, we have a um, business school, but also engineers. We have people who are in, at university. Uh, we have people who are in um, uh, law school, etc. So it's, uh, it was a very wide range of, of uh, people in terms of, uh, in terms of schools and well. All right. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Ludovic. Thank you. Thank you, Yves. Thank you, Ludovic. Uh, we are on time, so let's keep it that way. Um, now I'm very happy that he has accepted my invitation.
Uh, he's incubated from the prestigious uh, incubator Station F right in the center of Paris. He's also uh, um, a, a good friend of mine. Uh, Mathieu is here with us today. He's going to introduce you his company called Gilbert. Uh, Gilbert is the best service, best furniture storage service in Paris. And, and I'm saying that because I really love their vision. That is to store your physical asset the same way you store your data, like in the cloud. So how do you store a table uh, or a bed in the cloud? He's going to answer to that. Uh, don't forget to ask your question in the chat. Thank you very much. Mathieu, Gilbert, the, the floor is yours. Hi, uh, Sebastian. Thanks for the um, kind introduction. Um, well, be here, and I'm happy to say that again. My name is Matt, and I'm uh, kind of telling more about um, so um, yeah, let's start with, with a statistic. Um, so today it costs three times more to uh, to rent a self storage space in Paris than it does to rent an apartment. Um, this is crazy. Why does it, it I mean why does it cost more to store boxes in Paris than to live? And actually, the answer is quite simple. The reason is because of strict zoning laws in dense urban areas. Um, and so because of this, this actually limits the supply of storage, while on the other hand, demand for storage is very high. So whenever there's a, there's a, uh, so there's, there's a lack of um, supply and a lot of demand, so that means the prices are high. And it systems that um, service levels are low. Um, so today, if you want to move into self-storage space, you have to rent a truck, you've got to call a friend, you'll soon realize that your fridge doesn't fit in your elevator and you live on the sixth floor, so you'll need to bring it down. Um, you'll likely get a parking ticket and a month later, you'll completely forgotten what's in storage. So this is when we came up with the idea of Gilbert, which is why don't we take that storage space um, in Paris, move it to the suburbs where rent is, uh, where, where rent is cheaper and also where um, zoning laws are less restricted. We do that, but we also give the same proximity to the customer by um, coming up and picking up straight from their door. Uh, so this is our model. So we pick up, we send a team of friendly mover to your door, pick up straight from your door. We store everything in our secure warehouse. And whenever the customer wants their stuff back, we deliver within 24 hours. Uh, so that's it. this. And in addition, we take a photo of all the items um, stored and so the customer can access them uh, online and also order them uh, individually uh, to the address um, of his choice. So how do we make money? Um, we're a subscription service, so 80% of our revenue uh, is recurring uh, and this is mainly in the form of monthly storage payments. Uh, in addition, we can upsell the customer with additional insurance uh, and so on both of these, we have a gross margin of about of 68%. So this is, um, so this margin is our storage revenue minus all our direct um, storage costs, which include rent, uh, property taxes, um, insurance, and some direct labor. And then so the remaining 20% of our revenue is one-off and transactional revenue, which is mainly linked to transport, picking up, packing, uh, delivery. Um, here we've decided to pitch at cost, uh, and so we have a gross margin of zero uh, on this as part of the, the business. Uh, and so a typical customer will stay about 10 months in storage, uh, which gives us a lifetime value of 920 euros per customer. Let's take a look at the, at the market. So um, storage is big business. Today, worldwide, it's a 40 billion euro industry, mainly driven by the US. Uh, Three billion of that is in Europe. Um, and what I find amazing about this industry is that it's growing at close to 10% a year. Uh, and the reasons why are, are structural. People are consuming more um, and not enough houses are being built in Europe, uh, which means people have less space uh, and hence need to store more. Um, also, here's a little fun fact I like to put in, in perspective. Um, in the US, one in every 10 households is using storage today. Um, in Europe, it's only about one in 200. So clearly the opportun opportunities for growth in Europe are, are huge. Um, and Europe is just actually following the US, but with a 15-year with timeline. 
And so, so back to our competitive advantage. So, so how do we offer better storage rates? Uh, well, so again, it's simple. We move a warehouse out of a city where real estate is cheaper, um, but we also are able to optimize how we store by stacking on multiple floors high, which means we can store more volume uh, per square meter um, and hence helping us bring down our, um, our storage costs. Here's our, here's our wonderful team. Um, so myself, I'm a 19J um, MBA, also work for a direct uh, to consumer, consumer solar startup in the US, which grew from 17 to 300 employees in, in the space of three years. Uh, we also have Deborah, who's in charge of our growth, our digital marketing and our sales. And then Maxime, who takes care of all our warehousing and uh, logistics. Uh, and so as, as Sebastian said, we're incubated at, uh, at Here's our here's been our roadmap so far. So founded in September 2019, we focused on um, launching our MVP, on testing uh, different value propositions, different sales channels, different pricings. Uh, our key hires at the times were interns. Um, that's that's a, that's the truth of it. Uh, and we, we managed to get the business to 4,800 euros in monthly recurring revenue, which is where we are roughly today. Now we're in a phase of optimization. We're building out our operational infrastructure. We just moved into a new warehouse about a month ago. We're putting up pallet racking um, actually tomorrow, uh, and we're hiring a few more people. Uh, we've also raised 500,000 euros to, to finance this growth. And so um, towards the end of 2022, we'll be looking at expanding outside of Paris, either to other uh, French cities or other parts of Europe. Here are some of our revenue and EBITDA forecast. As you can see, we already have um, close to over 200 customers. Um, we're, we're, um, and you're going to see that our, our fixed costs are actually quite high at the moment as we invest in growth. Uh, but as we get more and more volume, um, we'll actually start to amortize that those, those fixed costs over more volume. Today, we're actually profitable on a um, per unit um, basis for, for each customer, which is quite exciting. Um, that's all I have for you um, today. Um, I'm curious to have any feedback uh, on, on, on just our presentation or idea in general. Uh, we're looking to raise um, 2 million euros probably by the end of the year or early next year. So if you have any feedback from that perspective, I, I'd love to hear it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mathieu. Um, so please, everyone, we have a first question. Don't be shy. Ask the question, would you use the service? Would you invest in the company? Why? Um, and so before reading the question from the crowd, Mathieu, uh, do you have a better understanding of your, who are your current customers? Uh, why they need your service? What do they say? How do they, what do they say positively about your service? What they like with Gilbert, they don't find elsewhere. Well, so we, they sort of customers, we have a few different use cases. So one is people when they're moving, when they're in between homes, uh, you know, they sell a home, they sell a home, then they might need a few months to find a new one. And so they'll store their stuff. Or we also have a lot of students. We actually started off at, at INSEAD. Um, a lot of students, mostly international students who, who, who travel abroad. Um, we also have expatriates um, who move abroad. Obviously, we have less of those with COVID now. Um, we also have everything linked, well, people who just don't have enough space at home. Uh, this is a real thing in Paris where a lot of people also don't have basements. Um, and also, um, and also just, uh, yeah, I had not one, but I forgot it. Anyway, and then, sorry, you're, you're, so what do customers like? So customers like that the storage, that, that actually it's a moving plus storage um, service. So you only have to deal with one intermediary. Um, we also really focus on um, our, again, as you can see here, it's still fewer customers. People um, like to see that. And, uh, and also just our quality, we've got great reviews online. Um, and so we try to, try to keep okay. that. Okay, we have we have questions from from the crowd from David. Very interesting. Would you consider allowing your customers who store uh, furniture to offer subleasing arrangement and let them rent their furniture to others? It's a good question. We've we've considered it, but actually the, the economics just don't work out. It's too complicated. If you know, if a customer, someone borrows the furniture, it gets damaged. You know, who's responsible? Who damaged it? It actually, it actually adds quite a lot of complexity to the logistics, um, and, and I, I just don't think the economics would work. Okay. Um, do you offer rebates or discounts to people referring uh, to friends? Yes, we do. We, um, we have a referral program, 
where we get both a referral and refer rate 50 euros off. Okay. Um, at the end, guys, at the end of the session, for those who have a few moments, you will have the, the uh, possibility to uh, ask some more questions. So maybe just one more now uh, from Cesar. Can customer do some selection and partial retrieval of the stuff, or do they have to order everything back? Uh, yes, absolutely. They order more part of our store. That's the mess. That's what we have. This is this app uh, where, where customers can um, individually select what, I, what items they want delivered and when. We've actually had many customers so far who have, you know, who have just asked for you know, a few of their boxes back and then even put additional ones into storage. So it's, it's exactly, um, it's, it, we, can, we can completely do that. And we already have customers using this feature. Well, thank you very much, Mathieu. We have some uh, other questions from the from the chat, but maybe you'll stay at the end of the session to to give some answers, right? Thank you very much, Mathieu. And uh, now the floor is going to next startup. Thank you, Sebastian. Could you stop sharing, please, Matthew? There we go. Um, whilst Vivi loads up her deck, I'd just like to introduce Vivi from AltaVita. She's CEO and co-founder. Uh, she's a rare breed that she has a female co-founder. I've known Vivi about three years. Her tenacity and perseverance absolutely amazes me. So I'll let Vivi tell you some more. Well, thank you, Charlie, for uh, supporting me. Uh, my co-founder, Carly. Uh, in Altavita from our humble beginning. Um, my name is Vivi Chayadi Himel. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Altavita. Um, have you ever been sent on a project uh, assignment or relocated by your employer, but realized they put you in a subpar accommodation? And when you arrive, Wi-Fi isn't working, linens aren't fresh. Well, this is what goes behind the scene. When an employee requires housing, this is what relocation manager deals with. Um, team companies are involved, leveraging on each other's inventories, creating this cascading commission structure. They do this because no one has truly global and live inventories. Even after this lengthy process, employee gets their housing options in this malformatted email and PDF. And their $200 per night budget basically gives them $100 worth of property. Corporate housing has been known for being very slow in adopting innovation. Um, this is uh, our product market fit. Um, COVID is a testament to this problem as two of the large legacy companies we are disrupting have essentially disappeared from the market. Um, it's a unique opportunity to be the winner takes all in the $50 billion corporate housing market. Our software consolidates the very fragmented property market as we integrate directly with property management system, removing the need for any manual entry and then data only has to be entered once. Now, relocation manager can set uh, their budget with different corporate policies uh, easily in the back end. And then employees are receiving their housing options in this very thoughtful and structured format. Our powerful white labeling API means that no one has to rebrand with email and PDF anymore. And behind the scene, our operation team is meticulously delivering top tier uh, quality control process, both on the supplier level, as well as on the property level. We also do a pre-inspection protocol, which requires property manager to submit a very detailed reports with live videos and live um, photos 24 hours before each employee checks in. We are the only company who's been able to deliver this at scale in the corporate housing sector. So we are a very proud female-led company. Uh, very blessed to have met my co-founder, uh, Karolina Saviova. She and I, we share the same tenacity, vision, and perseverance when it comes to Alta Vita. She's been uh, incredible in uh, building uh, an amazing, engaging ecosystem of supply partners, as well as driving our global expansion. We're very, very proud of our team culture um, as we grew our members from nine people before the pandemic to now 
about 23 people. Key leaderships include Carolyn Boyle, who is our employee number one. She's championing our operation in revenue management. Francois Jolie is our digital marketing guru. Uh, Brent Cross um, is our brand ambassador. He's opening doors in front of our key clients, multinational and relocation companies. Um, Ihor is a system engineer genius. Uh, he's built our infrastructure to be the best in class. Um, well, before Asset Labs became trendy uh, with, with the collapse of WeWork, we've actually been implementing very strict balance sheet and risk management and a simple revenue model with, based on commissions that we receive. Um, the market is very fragmented with many legacy models who failed to adopt innovation in many of the more consumer-centric brands, but without any duty of care compliance in place. We really have the, the best opportunity here to be the dominator in the market, the winner um, of the sector with our winning formula combining compliance as well as scalable infrastructure. Um, during the pandemic, we seized the opportunity to expand globally uh, using a combination of API integration and supply partner ecosystem building. We now have 200,000 properties live in our system as well as very diversified housing options. Last year, we, we uh, initiated a five-day symposium, uh, which was very well reviewed with meaningful, engaging and unbiased content. Uh, we had 4,600 viewers. With that, we won a new client, Ayers, which is one of the largest relocation companies in the world, moving 30,000 employees per year, equivalent of potential revenue of $15 million for Altuvita. We also build um, a robust data protection and information security. Um, with that, we won the US federal agencies and we are going live with them this month. We're also piloting with the largest relocation companies uh, with three oil and gas companies, equivalent revenue of $80 million. As with the um, rise of um, work from where, work from anywhere trend, we will also be working with PEO and EOR companies. Um, we've already secured one of the leading companies as our client. With this momentum, we're going to be launching the AltaVita Corporate Housing Innovation Summit this spring. Um, it's five days, five continents, five problems, and five product features. This is the first uh, that's ever been done in the sector, bringing product development live um, from crowdsourcing the problem to prototyping, testing, and then to product launching. Vivi, you've got four minutes left for questions. Yep, thank you, Charlie. Um, so yeah, so this is our traction so far. Um, we've been uh, onboarding these technology companies as our early adopters and winning many more um, high profile clients as well as recording 300% year-on-year growth in 2020. Um, our first point of attack is to work with these top relocation companies, uh, which collectively move about 1 million employees per year. And we've already secured 21%, and we're in advanced discussion with the remaining 20%. With this, we're confident we'll, we'll deliver a GMV of half a billion um, dollars as well as 500 million dollars by 2024 and we want to raise our series a this year and i'd like to thank you for this opportunity thank you okay we have a very short amount of time for questions now so geographic coverage please could you explain yep we were a pan-european player just before the pandemic um, we, we were in every corner of europe uh, as well as middle east but we've now launched in APAC in North America, Latin America, and Latin America, as well as a few cities in Africa. Thank you. How are you differentiating yourself from Airbnb for business? Very easy. Uh, Airbnb does not um, deliver accountability, no compliance, no duty of care. This is our DNA. Um, how do you actually solve the $200 per night budget, given the $100 per night property? Do you mean to replace all the intermediary eight? If so, exactly. how, you, how do you acquire properties to offer them to rent on your platform? Yeah, precisely. Basically, we want to disintermediate uh, these middlemen. Uh, we want to, to, to kill our, all of them, and we want to be the dominated uh, player so that 
employee can enjoy their $200 budget. Okay, thank you. COVID impact, do you think companies will still move expats across the world? Absolutely. Um, there's a lot of talks about this, um, but the, there are key uh, fundamental reasons why employees or talent are being relocated to the required regions. Number one, passporting rights, license to operate. Number two, IP protection. Number three, trusted employees in difficult markets. There are many, many reasons why employees are being relocated. Okay, thank you. Could you explain your monetization model further, please? Does it mean revenue or exit? Revenue. Yep, so a simple uh, commission-based model. So 9%, uh, which is usually equivalent to $500 per booking for us. Okay, and your client acquisition strategy, could you expand a little bit more on that, please? Yep, so our first point of attack, um, our all of our focus now is devoted towards closing top 20 relocation companies who together move 1 million employees. That represents 5 billion um, dollars of market, which is about 10% of our of the whole of corporate housing market. Okay, thank you. And the timing of your $5 million uh, raise, when will when are you planning to do that? Yep, we're just launching it this month. Um, we're hoping that by, by the end of summer, we'll all, already be closing this round. Okay, thank you very much, Vivi. Um, hang around in case anybody else wants to talk to you at the end. Thank you. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you. If you could stop sharing and then if uh, James could please um, share. So uh, James is a serial entrepreneur. I've known him many years too. Um, he built Resolver, his first uh, business, up to 18 million unique users per annum. Um, he's great at starting businesses and then handing it over to a CEO that can scale. So now he's into Jam Donut and love to hear from you, James. Brilliant. Afternoon, everyone. And I am the last thing, hopefully now, between you and your lunch. So we'll make sure we finish on time. So as Charlie said, um, I started a business previously called Resolver. And as part of that, what I realized was that to me, fundamentally, the consumer market is broken on so many different levels. You know, if you believe that ratings are trustworthy, if you believe that loyalty schemes are giving you loyalty, and if you're finding customer service easy, then you will not relate to this business. Fundamentally, we look at the market and look at it and go, actually, you know what? Ratings are designed to get consumers to convert. They're not there to help consumers know who to buy from. The average rating on Trustpilot in the UK is 4.8 out of 5, the average. Um, reward schemes are giving back typically 25 pence for every £100 you spend. It's really not worth getting a card out your pocket. And 50% of consumers are dissatisfied when they raise an issue with a business. It's getting harder and harder to get hold of people and you're more and more dissatisfied with what they deliver. So if we were a dating app, not only would we help you find the person you'd want to marry, we'd help arrange your marriage and make sure your divorce doesn't happen. So what we're doing is helping look at the way that you spend money, working out the brands that actually align with your brand values, introducing you to them, but making sure that if something goes wrong, we help solve it. So it's not just down to you and the business. We carry on being part of that relationship. And in terms of the rewards that we execute upon on for the consumer, we are talking about three times the amount that you'll see anywhere else. So actually, your reward level, we are talking about a consumer being able to use our service and get back between six and eight hundred pounds a year. A bit like going and asking your boss for a fifteen hundred pound pay rise, but with a lot less hassle. In terms of how we deliver it, it's an app. We're linking into a number of different things. So we're pulling in from open banking. We are the first loyalty app that is using open banking as an insight set of data. The consumer is giving us automatically through that who that they trust because who they keep buying from. And we look at those brand values. We use a predictive model to then work out actually what is the best either direct match or indirect match for the consumer. And if anything ever goes wrong, we step in and help solve it, and we use that resolution insight data to work out which businesses you wouldn't want to be buying from. In terms of market, there are 31 million consumers in the UK that have a loyalty card. A lot of them don't use them. But actually, we see ourselves as being comparable to 
either a paid bank account or an add-on insurance because we are there to look after the consumer. We are there to make sure they know who to buy from, that they're always getting the right deals and that if anything goes wrong, we're protecting them. Where are we at? We started last March. Um, we've been building away. Uh, we are going live next week with our final test. And then at the beginning of April, we go uh, out to market with a short-term um, loan lender in the UK that's giving us access to 1 million consumers. Uh, we're finalizing the go negotiations to get another 2.5 million consumers as access by the summer. Uh, and in September, the 2.1 million students that come back into the UK will see over the TVs, uh, TV screens and all the student unions around the country will see um, Jam Donut being presented to them. We've done two small investment rounds so far. We're going to do a 300k round shortly that will take us through till next year, at which point we we'll then go and do a Series A. Um, we've kept the business lean and mean. Uh, effectively, we are um, going to achieve a profitability at around 30 to 40,000 active users, and we are pre being presented to over 100,000 active users or potential users, I should say, a month. So our aim is low acquisition costs, get the revenue up as much as possible, as quickly as possible with the users, uh, break even, and then look to do a Series A raise. In terms of the team, we're actually pulling in a number of different areas because we're looking at reviews. We're looking at open banking. We're pulling in resolution and rewards. Uh, so myself has got a background in the bank uh, in uh, uh, resolution and with ratings. Dan brings in the insights on rewards and payment systems. Anthony's former product development from Apple in California, uh, and James has been helping us do the deals. So. We actually see a vision for what we're doing here going above, beyond just a loyalty program for large businesses, but actually we've got the tech already built and ready to go where we can start looking at small businesses and helping them to build a loyalty program that won't cost them a penny, but gives every consumer over 1% cash back on what they buy. I think for me, the key bit about our business is that this is a triple trust play. You trust who to buy from because we give you true ratings. You can trust us to make sure you're getting the best rewards and you can trust us if anything goes wrong, we'll help solve it for you. You know, we are a loyalty app that is there to be your life app. Thank you. Um, thank you, James. Uh, could you expand a little bit more on your user acquisition strategy, please? Yeah, it's pretty simple. Um, what we're going to do is work with key brands that are out there see the value in a service that helps the consumer save money and they're going to promote the service uh, for free of charge out to their consumer base for us. Okay, thanks. Could you tell us more about the monetization, please? Absolutely. So what we're effectively doing is uh, an affiliate revenue model whereby we are making money as part of a margin from any deals that the, um, the consumer takes. Our margin levels that we're running at at the moment are double those of any other loyalty scheme in the market. So that means that, you know, for example, if I take um, a home delivery service like Deliveroo in the UK, we've got 8% margin to play with. We can give four to the consumer and we keep four ourselves. Okay, thanks. Slightly related questions. You mentioned something about a consumer getting a roughly six to 800 pounds back a year. So how, how does that work exactly? So we've got covered off within the scheme around 75% of the supermarkets in the UK, all the home delivery, food services, uh, the main coffee shops, the main restaurants, looking at the average consumer spend, what they do is effectively do the purchase through us and we give them a code to use at either checkout or with the restaurant. Uh, that does the full payment for them. And every time they use that, we put money back into a point scheme and the consumer can cash out at any time they've got over £10. Thank you. You mentioned um, using open banking. How exactly are you doing this? So the consumer, when they onboard, uh, does a very quick onboarding. We give them around £2.50 for onboarding, £2.50 for then linking to open banking. It's very quick and simple. It allows us to be able to see the consumer's transactions, not to be able to control their account. And what we do is at T0, immediately they do that within 20 seconds. We've analyzed their spend from the last three years and we give them a set of recommendations on how to be better with their money um, and therefore how to be able to budget better and save. 
Thank you. Uh, why will you be the winner in the loyalty market? Because uh, actually, we are the only one that is truly looking after the consumer. Loyalty schemes are giving very little money back and there's no value in loyalty to the consumer. We're giving more money. We're telling you who you can trust to buy from. And actually, we're giving you better protection than you would get on a credit card or a debit card. So, you know, we are effectively creating the next generation of digital consumer champion because we will always look after you. Okay, thank you. You mentioned you're raising a smaller round now. I think it was 300K and you're yeah. going on to Series A. Could you just explain a little bit more about when exactly for the Series A? Sure. So the Series A, our intention is to do that towards the middle of next year. The money that effectively we will then start raising will be towards acquisition as we actually have to do uh, start raising or start uh, paying for acquisition costs. But apart from that, the intention is to have the business as profitable in all other elements as quickly as possible. Perfect. Thank you very much, James. Pleasure. Thank you. Thanks, uh, James, and uh, thanks, uh, Charlie. Uh, we are about to, to end this uh, session. Before that, <clears throat> I'd like to thank uh, everyone, all the, all the startups, uh, for, for, for your uh, pitches. I want to thank Magali as well, who is behind the screen uh, organizing uh, everything. Uh, thanks, Magali. And um, uh, some of you asked questions about how to get in touch with uh, some of you. So, uh, Magali, could you please uh, display the, uh, uh, show you the contact of, uh, of uh, each of you, so Arinda, Ludovic, uh, Mathieu, uh, Vivi, and James, with the email address. So, anyone uh, who wants to get in touch with, uh, talk more about, uh, about a, uh, more questions or, or more uh, 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 things to share with uh, one of these, uh, five uh, brilliant uh, startups uh, today. So here are the, the name and the uh, email address. And um, and I think, uh, Sebastian, you want to pass yeah, the message we, as well? <clears throat> we have just a few minutes, so don't hesitate if you want to ask one, one question, two questions. We still have a few minutes. Uh, while you're typing your questions, I wanted, because we have with us in the crowd today, uh, Vimy Emraz from the Career Center of INSEAD. So um, as a reminder, during the summer, you have MBA uh, students that are available for internships. Uh, so don't hesitate to get in touch with Vimy at vimy.emraz, E-M-R-A-Z, at insead.edu. Uh, Vimy, if you want to put your email, maybe in the chat, that'd be easier. So don't hesitate if you want to get a great intern for the summer, great and cheap. Uh, brain for the summer. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I think we had great, great startup today. Thank you uh, to all like, the founders. You want like cheap and thank you, Sahitya. Uh, thank you to all the founders who gave their time today to the crowd for your wonderful questions. Please get in touch and thank you. I think we'll see you next time uh, in a month. You'll receive the invitation from the association. Have a very good day and thank you again. See you next time. Yeah, thank you everyone. Thank you everyone. Yeah, thank you. See you next time. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks.